Every year, thousands of Hindus are drawn up into the mountains by the age-old pilgrimage to the source of the river Ganges. The source lies deep in the glaciers of the high Himalayas on the very borders of Tibet. To many Hindus, it is simply the most sacred place on earth. I've always wanted to travel there, both because of its sheer remoteness and because it seems to lie at the very heart of the mystery of Hinduism. At first sight, Hardwar looks like any other small Indian town. But what draws travellers here is its position on the banks of the Ganges, just as the river gushes out of the mountain. It is the essential starting point of any journey to the source. By bathing in the river, the pilgrims here believe that they can cleanse themselves of a lifetime of sins. The Hindu scriptures are agreed that the Ganges is both river and goddess, and so a tirtha, a crossing place where you can move from the world of men to the world of gods as easily as you might step across a stream. But if Hindus believe in sacred space, they also believe in pools of sacred time. That there is a moment every 12 years when if you bathe in the river, your prayers will be more quickly heard and readily fulfilled than at any other point in time or space. It is as if a window momentarily clicks open in the heavens, allowing direct access to the divine. And I have come at the precise moment when, once every 12 years, this happens. And without any formal publicity or propaganda, the Ganges draws no less than 10 million pilgrims in a festival called the Kumela, the largest religious gathering on earth. The pilgrims are made up of simple villagers, sophisticated city dwellers, and above all, the holy men, the sadhus, who descend on Hardwar for a festival that makes Glastonbury look like a picnic in the park. I've seen the sadhus in my travels all over India and found them slightly menacing figures with their dreadlocked hair and wild, often unpredictable behavior. It's only seeing them now arriving in such numbers for this great festival it makes me realize quite how many of them there are and how many different forms they take. Some are freelance wanderers moving from town to town. Others live ordered monastic lives in ashrams, dividing their day according to strict rules and performing severe penances. Most fascinating of all are the naked Naga sadhus, the ashmered warrior ascetics who throughout Indian history have formed the shock troops of Hinduism. It's the promise of directly accessing the gods which has drawn them and literally millions of ordinary Hindus to the banks of the Ganges to bathe and to worship. Overnight, a small market town the size of Saffron Walden is transformed into a heaving metropolis, larger than New York. Some of these pilgrims will, like me, be attempting the difficult path up to the source of this extraordinary river. The sheer size of the Kumela may be astonishing, but what I personally find more remarkable is its almost unbelievable antiquity. For the tradition of bathing in the Ganges here at Hardwar predates Islam, Christianity, and even the worship of the gods of ancient Rome. The ritual you see today at the Kum is described in the Rig Veda, India's oldest sacred text, written when both the pyramids and Stonehenge were still in use. Yet while Isis and Zeus are dead and forgotten, the river goddess Ganges is now more revered than ever. 
the goddess is seen as a mother, Ganga Ma, who comforts her children and is tangible, approachable and all-accepting. The essence of compassion in liquid form. Nowhere is this seen more clearly than in the case of the untouchables. This is the darker side of Hinduism. The untouchables here tell me that in all Hardwa there was only one priest prepared to perform ceremonies for them, and that because of this he had been ostracized by his colleagues. But the river goddess, they said, was different. She turned no one away. In Hardwa, the untouchables, or Dalits, the oppressed as they prefer to be called, have their own lodging house, as, astonishingly, many other places still refuse to take them in. How easy is it to get the blessing of the goddess Ganges? It's easier to get the blessings of Mother Ganga than of any other god. The reason is that she lets everyone bathe in it, and no one else can stop you from going to it. That's why we can get her blessings. If caste is one aspect of Hinduism that most Westerners find difficult to understand, then this temple shows another potential stumbling block. Modern Hinduism, and it's most noisy and confusing. The great Hindu scriptures may be works of quiet philosophical subtlety, but as this temple shows, popular Hindu devotion today is often neither quiet nor subtle and can be deeply muddling for a Westerner to understand. As Hinduism has no founder, no single holy book, nor any central authority, it refuses to be pinned down. With every generalization you make about it, the exact opposite is often equally true. This pilgrimage is, for me, a chance to bring into focus this most elusive, and fluid of all religions. At the heart of this journey lie two deities, the gentle river goddess Ganga and her wild and tempestuous consort, the great god Shiva. The region through which we planned to pass was once known as Kedar Khand, the land of Shiva. Indeed, it is believed that the very slopes of the Himalayas are Shiva's matted locks, and that when the goddess Ganga came down from heaven to earth, Shiva caught and tamed her in his ascetic stresses. The heat, sakti, produced by their union, so the priests will tell you, ensures the preservation and regeneration of the universe. Shiva is in many ways the wild man of the Hindu pantheon, the dope-smoking loner who lives meditating on a peak in the remotest Himalayas, outside society and its constraints. <laughs> The pandas of Hardwa have for centuries been registering every pilgrim who's ever set off to the source of the Ganges. The records of these priests are remarkably comprehensive. North Berwick. No. North. North Berwick. Berwick. Berwick, Scotland, Maine. North Berwick. Hey, boys, sir. Rishikesh ki bus kahan se jayega? See there. Rishikesh ki bus. Rishikesh. Okay. The road to the source winds for a hundred miles through the foothills of the Himalayas, 
following the river Ganges as it meanders its way through the valleys. Rishikesh was where the Beatles came to learn the sitar from Ravi Shankar. Those were the days when dope was cheap and karma was king. Everyone who's anyone was a dharma bum, prepared to risk fleas and dysentery on the way to enlightenment, or at least Kathmandu. But times change. Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, who hosted the Beatles, now runs a business school that has not been seen in Rishikesh for 20 years. Even so, the town is still full of ashrams, and Rishikesh continues to attract hundreds of Westerners who are not too cynical to shave their heads and pay up in dollars for a course in transcendental meditation or the mysteries of Tantra. In the Divine Life Society, a pillar lists 20 instructions for achieving enlightenment. Do not overload the stomach, sleep separately, and avoid narcotics. No easy sex and drugs here. Above all, stick to your routine. Be good, do good. If only it were that easy. Yet for all the frauds who filled the garages of their ashrams with Rolls Royces by parting Westerners from their material goods, there are still in the caves around Rishikesh many genuine and deeply impressive ascetics who have given up everything to seek God through silence, solitude and meditation. As I was swimming, another holy man walked past, very different from my friend in the cave. Babaji was a Naga Sadhu, one of the warrior holy men who now, as in the days of the Buddha, go either naked or with just a loincloth and very few worldly goods. Although in this case, Babaji did have one very unexpected possession. Babaji, tell me about your motorbike. What do you want to know about this? Well, you, where's the, you have a hi-fi system somewhere. Where yeah, is it? Yeah, look. Hidden away in here? Yeah. <laughs> I have fixed just recently in Kumbha Mela. I was thinking long time, from long time to fix, but and this time I fix. And where do the cassettes go? Cassettes here. You have? <laughs> what kind of music do you like, Babaji? I like most religious. So I have most cassette religious. Can we hear? Yeah, possible. 
Babaji, where's the, where are the speakers? Speaker is here. Look, one this side, <laughs> one that side. Yeah. You got stereo. Yeah. It's a stereo, stereo. motorbike. I find myself making the next stage of the journey on the back of Babaji's motorbike, which, while exciting, poses one tricky question. If you're riding pillion with a naked holy man, where exactly are you supposed to put your hands? Do you can uh, drive your motorbike after smoking the stuff? Yes. <laughs> no problem? No problem. Safely? Yeah. <laughs> We're not going to end up under a bus. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> Did you see in the... But I drive slowly, not so much fast. Yeah. Otherwise, I need good road. Yeah. yeah. For a sannyasi, is it important to keep traveling? For sannyasi? For sannyasi, for sadhu, for baba? Yes. Then he is uh, Baba, you know, if he is traveling. But uh, really, really is very hard. To keep traveling? If, no. Traveling is the way of Baba. Right. But uh, there is be, uh, many rules for everything. Rules, 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 you know. Okay. So it's... Uh, That's India for you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, obviously, a sadhu's life can be very difficult. You've got... Pe Especially Naga Baba. No clothes, They are more uh, difficult and very hard and very angry also. Very yeah. angry. <laughs> and everybody is afraid in, in India from Naga Babas. In case they attack them. Attack <laughs> because they are more very strong, otherwise nobody is making one Naga Baba. Acha. But Babaji, it's important to suffer, to have blisters, to, to, to have all the discomforts of travelling. Yes. So why do you have the motorbike? This is also one way of devotee. Right. Some people even going by laying their road. Rolling. Rolling. I didn't think I was getting a straight answer from Babaji, who went into great detail about the different forms of asceticism practiced by Naga sadhus, without ever explaining why riding a motorbike could be a form of penance. But by the time I'd spent the rest of the afternoon on the back of his Enfield bullet, I was beginning to understand why. As Babaji and I rattle saddle sore over the potholes, we see a constant stream of sadhus walking the ancient pilgrimage route for the many weeks it takes to reach the source. There are also the pilgrims' buses, which, despite many warnings to the contrary and wrecks of past accidents, tend to treat the single-track road as if it were the Ganges Grand Prix. Nonetheless, we manage to arrive safely at the British hill station of Masuri. The Victorians liked to come up to the hills for the summer, indeed rather thought they'd invented the idea. It was a convenient journey from Delhi, and just as Simla became the Raj's summer capital of government, so Missouri became its summer capital of pleasure. In the old Savoy Hotel, the ghosts still linger. Queen Mary stayed here and sent a carved Indian walking stick back to Edward VII. In the 20s, the ballroom was constantly full, as the Raj danced out its small hours in a riot of high society and frenzied high-altitude adultery. One contemporary guest remembered that when the morning bell sounded, the pious would say their prayers, while the impious got back into their own beds. As Kipling wrote, Jack's own Jill went up the hill to Missouri and Chakrata. Jack remained and died in the plains, and Jill remarried soon after. Here I met Bill Aitken, a remarkable Scottish writer who has lived in these hills for the past 40 years. The amusing thing about the empire uh, at attitude that we started everything, we started the idea of hill stations where we estivated and uh, cut the summer heat. But in actual fact, it was the, the Hindu gods who started this notion of wintering 
in the lower regions and spending their summer in the snowy heights. They, they, long before the Alpine Club was founded, the Hindu gods had cottoned on to the idea that this is a great place to be in the hot weather. We're so used to the very Indianness and sort of exoticism of seeing Hindus bathing in rivers. But as you point out in your book, it's not a very different idea at all from the Western idea of baptism. Is that so? The moment you travel, uh, you suddenly discover the world is the same everywhere. The ideas, the depths of I I idea changes, but basically there's no difference. So Bill, what have I got ahead of me up the Ganges? Many people set off to the source of the Ganga, but unless the goddess pulls you, can shows you, you do not arrive. This is the absolute universal belief and people's experience that unless you're intended to arrive, you will not. The hill stations were about as far as most Victorians went. The idea of investigating the sacred geography of the Hindus had little appeal for the young bucks of the Missouri circuit. But this was not necessarily so for an earlier generation of travellers, several of whom lost their lives in the search for the source of the Ganges. The Scottish artist and explorer James Bailey Fraser was, in 1815, the first Westerner ever to penetrate to this then semi-mythical destination. As the area was in the hands of the Gurkhas of Nepal, the bitter enemies of the East India Company, Fraser was forced to travel incognito in the guise of a Hindu pilgrim. After weeks in the heat and dust of the North Indian plains, the flowering rhododendrons, the damp incense smell of the leaf mould and the sweet resinous scent of the conifers transported Fraser straight back to his Inverness home. As he trekked up the Ganges at the same time of year as us, he wrote in his log book, we now bound China and live in a climate very like Scotland. We can go and lie down under the oak, birch, larch or elm or gather wild strawberries and raspberries as at home. Asia is lost to our imaginations. As he trekked through the high Himalayas, or the great Himalaya as he called it, the artist made thousands of sketches which he later turned into these lithographs. It is astonishing to see how little the area has changed in nearly 200 years. We were reaching a turning point in the journey. After three weeks, we were now at 12,000 feet and approaching the snow line. Ahead lay the high peaks. So before leaving the last of the foothills, I decided to rest a few days in the village of Triyugi Narayan, said to be the site of the marriage of Shiva to the goddess Parvati. According to legend, so many gods gathered for the wedding celebrations that the top end of India began to sink into the ground with the weight and several deities had to be dispatched to the south to re-establish the balance. Their marriage flame is now said to have been alight for three yugi, or three epochs, hence the name of the village. While Triyugi Naran is famous throughout India as a central site in the mythology of Shiva, the villagers themselves looked not just to Shiva, but to an almost numberless pantheon of local sprites and godlings. The villagers take care to propitiate both Shiva and their particular village goddess, Achari Devi. Shiva controls the continuation of the wider cosmos, but it is Achari Devi, they believe, who regulates the daily life of the village. When you first come across it, it can seem as if it is this multiplicity of different gods which is the biggest single divide between Hinduism and the other great religions of the world. But it is not as foreign as it seems, because the more you talk to Hindus, the more you find that many of them believe that there is, in reality, only one god, of whom the different gods and goddesses are but forms, that they are like different lenses with which to perceive ultimate reality. In that sense, it's only a short jump away from the Christian idea of the Trinity. It's a simple idea, but to me, it certainly does help bring the apparent anarchy of Hinduism into sharp and immediate focus. While Shiva and the great gods are thought to be almost unimaginably remote, the local goddess plays an active part in village life, 
to her oracle. Twice a week, the oracle holds a surgery when she is entered and possessed by the goddess and through whom she offers advice, prophecies and cures to the villagers. Can the uh, goddess offer us any advice on getting to the source of the Ganges at Gamuk? At the time, I was convinced from her tone that it was all going terribly wrong, and that the oracle was condemning me to a major bus crash, followed by eternal hellfire. But later, when her thick Garwali accent was translated for me, it turned out that she was in fact telling us that not only would we reach the source, but that I would safely return to the Himalayas in the future. However, there was a sting in the tail. Well, her performance just put us all in the right dilemma, because uh, in the course of her predictions, uh, the oracles, were saying all sorts of nice things about um, my family life and so on, demanded an eight-animal sacrifice, an astaboli, uh, which was going to cost us 15,000 rupees, uh, or around 250 pounds, which is the average income of uh, some of the uh, hillmen up here. Um, on the face of it, of course, there's outright extortion, um, and uh, you can argue that she's just after our cash. But interestingly, none of the crew, particularly me, was really quite willing to risk the curse. Um, the only exception was Nandu, our sound recordist, who, uh, significantly enough, uh, is the only practicing Hindu among us. Having negotiated a compromise and left a small offering to appease the goddess, I headed on up the hill, knowing that at the top in Gori Kund, there awaited a set of hot springs and the nearest thing to a decent bath I get in three weeks of sweaty trekking. The hot baths at Gori Kund were built by divine appointment and are said to be a particular favourite of Gori, the wife of Shiva, after whom they were named. It's true there was no sign of her the afternoon I was there, but bathing in her place was a Tamil professor who swam up and introduced himself as the president of the Madras Wordsworth Society. The beautiful experience, which is not an experience, which is the absolute one, which cannot be caught by the mind, which cannot be caught by the psyche, which cannot be caught by the body, or by any known instruments, because it doesn't speak of the object, it speaks of the subject. And all of us are the subjects, and therefore the subject you experience something which is very difficult, and the word experience doesn't cover it, because therefore you'll have to introduce a new word, it is not yet put it. It is experience and not experience. Imagine taking place, taking place within you because you are that. There, there is no God other than you. What is inside you is that God. You must discover it. But that sounds more that, like... See, in every individual, there is a Christ hidden and there is a devil that is there. It is for you to invoke the Christ and suppress the devil. But this, that sounds, is this sounds more like Vedanta than Wordsworth. This Vedanta, is Vedanta. 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 Wordsworth, <laughs> Wordsworth is the greatest Vedantist. Yes? He, he lived in the Lake District. He lived in the Lake District and all his time he was only in, in tune with nature. And worshipping nature is not pagan worship. It is worshipping the... Beautiful force that is behind nature, the phenomenal forces behind nature. It is not the tree that is important, it is the force that flows through the tree, as Chelly says in that beautiful cloud. The professor seemed like an unstoppable force of words worthy in nature himself. But finally, I got a word in edgeways. I have the hope the spring will come and make it come up. 
So do you mean we've come all the way, 16,000 miles to Kedernath, and we should just have gone to the Lake District? Yes. <laughs> I have not gone to the Lake District, but I am through. If I close my eyes, I remember everything of Wordsworth, right from his childhood, his boyhood days. The entire, the entire... By now, the river has turned into a mountain torrent, and the tarmac road has given way to a winding goat path, impassable even by jeep. Here, everyone has to start walking, unless they can afford a horse or a porter. This wonderful road is like a great river of Indian humanity. Every caste from every corner of the country is here. You've got uh, simple villagers, money lenders, literate holy men, urban sophisticates from the north and south, all rubbing shoulders together like something out of a modern Indian Canterbury Tales. The rich go up on ponies or palaquins or even doolies, which are like kind of rucksacks strapped to deck chairs. But the vast majority of poor pilgrims have no option but to walk. I consider this to be a religious duty and that this is the right way to serve God and attain salvation. I see God everywhere. So, so, so aren't, you, is, aren't you at all concerned what's happened to your wife in your absence, whether she's ill or, or upset? Don't you miss family life? Did you miss your family? No, I don't miss them. There is no point in remembering or missing things which are past and gone. We should look forward to what is yet to come. When you are progressing on a road, you don't have to think about the events that have occurred in the past. You just have to think about what is lying ahead. But you have reminded me of my family. That's the miracle of it. <laughs> The climb is long and grueling as the path corkscrews relentlessly uphill for 5,000 feet through a valley cut by one of the Ganges' major tributaries. The air is thin, and by late afternoon we find ourselves trudging through thick snow. I find it very hard work, but am put to shame by the other pilgrims. Some of them are barefoot, others wrapped only in plastic sheeting. Most have never seen snow before, and few have ever experienced a night at this altitude, or indeed have any idea what to expect when they arrive. This is where the pilgrims are all being drawn, the home of the most powerful of all the gods, Lord Shiva. The great temple of Kedanat. It is the most important stopping point on the way to the source.
West, we're used to religions that put their emphasis on scriptures, the written word, whether it's the Bible, the Quran, or the Torah. But what I find so refreshing about Hinduism is that it's such a wonderfully visual religion. The final climax of Hindu worship is to have darshan, to actually see the divine image. When I talk to the pilgrims here and ask them why they've come, the overwhelming majority say they're coming for this reason, to do darshan, to meet the eyes of God. It is perhaps for this reason that the images of most Hindu gods are shown with huge eyes. The gaze of the god meets the eyes of the worshipper, and it is in this exchange of vision that lies the very heart of Hindu worship. Anyone brought up with the relatively unemotional church services of the West cannot help but be profoundly struck by these intense scenes of religious ecstasy. It's all the more moving when you consider that the pilgrims, many of whom are well into their 70s, have just walked 30 kilometers steeply uphill, and many are now preparing to spend a night out in the open in sub-zero temperatures, many with no more than a homespun wrap to keep them warm. as well as the pilgrims who flock up here for the night, Kedinat has a more permanent population of sadhus, most of whom are followers of Shiva. For Shiva is the aloof Himalayan ascetic, disconcerting and unpredictable, who lives meditating in the wilderness of the snows, focused inward in meditation. These mountains are his domain, and like him, the sadhus who trek up here are consciously turning their back on society and its rules, in an effort to find moksha, enlightenment, in the clear air and crystal silence of the mountains. Maharaj, when did you take up sannyas? I took up sannyas when I was 10 years old. 10? Why? This life, this ocean of life. I wanted to run away from it all, and when I was running, I happened to come into contact with a saint, an enlightened soul, and that is why I took up sannyas. <laughs> Many of the sadhus have taken vows of silence which can last for decades. This man has taken a vow to remain standing for 12 years. He has already done seven of them. He sleeps standing up, supported by a swing. Astonishingly, this is not even the first time he has done it. As a young man, he did precisely the same for eight years. He sees this as an attempt to master his body and its demands, and so, as he puts it, to gain the self-confidence that helps you muster the courage to approach God. In his face, one can see the almost unimaginable pain and determination it must take to keep to such a path. It's the next stage in the pilgrimage that separates the real devotees from what Hindus sometimes call dongi sadhus, hollow holy men. For from Kedanat, you carry on towards the final source of the Ganges by walking the ancient Yatra or pilgrimage route across some of the highest ridges in the world. Apart from a few foresters and shepherds, no one lives on these high passes. Here, it is said, 
Shiva can sometimes be stumbled across in the form of a goat herd. It's very wild country, and only the most serious sadhus would even dream of coming up here. After walking for several days through the high meadows, you find yourself in the very middle of the Himalayas, miles from any road. It is as if you have entered a kind of Jack and the Beanstalk world of indeterminate date, place or period. The old Yatra route winds its way across the hills. After nearly 100 kilometers, it arrives at Gangotri, the last staging post on the journey. When a temple was first built here some 2,000 years ago, Gangotri was actually the source of the Ganges. But since then, the glacier which feeds the river has retreated some 20 miles up the valley, and the source is now a day and a half's trek from the temple. It's another measure of the sheer antiquity of this extraordinary religion, as if Hinduism is a faith whose history is to be recorded not in human, but in geological time. उसने कहा कि भाई यहाँ से मैं नाचा थी पर दूसरी गांव में चले गए। फिर बारसू में दो तीन औरतें मतलब वहाँ भी नाचना शुरू कर दिया उन्होंने। फिर वहाँ भी हो गया। तो बारसू वाले फिर हमारे गांव में आए। अब मुझे बुलाने के लिए। On the last night of the pilgrimage, there is a real air of expectancy and anticipation as the actors gather around the campfire. We listen to a story being told about an evil spirit which possesses an entire village before being heroically exercised by the storyteller himself. The final stage of the trek is through an almost symbolic wasteland an inhospitable, high-altitude moonscape, 12,000 feet high, burningly hot by day, icily cold by night, as one approaches the ring of high Himalayan mountains which guard the source. <laughs> At dawn the following morning, I finally arrive, making my way through a bitter wind to the vast glacier at the end of the valley, where the river emerges fully formed, 
from a crystal amphitheater of solid ice. You don't have to be a Hindu to feel that this desolate, windswept wasteland at the source of the Ganges is one of the most extraordinary and suggestive places on the face of the earth. It is, as nowhere else, a theatre or sacred ford, a place for crossing over, where the divine touches on the mundane and the human. This then is where it all begins. No man-made shrine or structure breaks the solitude. No priest intervenes between God and man. Here the pilgrim can perform the ultimate darshan to worship not an image but the living goddess as she breaks free from her prison of ice on her journey from heaven to earth. Only when you see such a sight in the pre-dawn glimmer of a sub-zero Himalayan morning can you really grasp how easy it is to deify such a river. Jai Gangama. Thank you. 